you're listening to the Money Monopolizers Podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. It's about time that we invest more in our financial literacy and work towards building generational wealth. If you think you're ready to do the same, then you've come to the right place. Alex, Marlon, y'all ready? Let's get this bread. What's good, everybody? It's Alex Comunio here. We are back with episode 18 of the Money Monopolizers podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Marlon Walls. Marlon, how you doing today, bro? Doing good, man. I had another long week. I had a test and three projects due. This is just, that's that school life that you, you you don't know nothing about that no more. But nope. Hey, I I got one more year, man. Well, I got about nine months left. I'm excited. I'm just trying to grind it out, though. Um, I'm hoping that we can get this house closed. I know we ran through a couple of difficulties with that as far as getting that property in Houston closed. But I think we'll be having that done by prior early this week, and we'll be able to get the ball rolling on there. Same thing with the flip in San Antonio. I'm hoping that we can get the ball rolling, like so far as the rehab on that too. Yeah, it's been um, <laughs> very, very annoying <laughs> that project to say the least. Yeah. So that has our, that project has stalled now. We haven't really made any progress on it in the last what two weeks. It's pretty much been stagnant, just because of the issue with um, the contractor and the lender. So. But that's what happens in this game. I mean, you just gotta take them blows because they hurt each day that we don't move, make progress on that house. We losing money, so I mean, that's what happens whenever <laughs> you in this game. You gotta be ready for that. But it's all yeah. good. It is what it is. I knew what I signed up for. So. Lots of learning experiences though along the way. I would say the least. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's definitely a lot learning from this one, just in terms of like you know talking to. Uh, People and also managing contractors. That is a whole new learning experience. So it's all good. This is when, you know, school of hard knocks. You learn it for now so you don't have to, you know, do it again in the future. So. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but, yeah, other than that, you know, everything is all good over here. I'm just chilling. But we got another good episode. Um, today we are talking about how you can scale your income. This is not – this is really a topic that we had – we hadn't really thought too much about. We do talk about it. Just in conversation a lot, not necessarily in the terms I discuss it today, but really just in more general terms of like ways of how you can earn more money. And because, uh, you know, at the Money Monopolizer, we always say that our, well, we don't always say it, but we believe that our core values are, you know, number one, it's uh, taking control of your finances through earning more money, taking control of your finances by cutting your expenses and your money mindset. And how those three things correlate to, uh, you know, kind of help you achieve your financial goals and take control of your financial destiny. So today, the episode is more, you know, geared towards how you can earn more money and or take control of your finances through earning more money. So, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, let's get into this episode, though. So what we're going to do for this episode is we're going to pretty much be talking about the three main ways that there are to increase your earned income. Um, earned income is just, you know, any income that you get from trading in your time for it, right, Marlon? This is just anything that's like, you know, W-2 in, a W two job, uh, you know, any type of job, self-employed job, any type of job where you trade in your time to get money, that is what we're considering earned income. So we're talking primarily about how you can scale that and uh, how that kind of looks and, it, you know, which is the most practical look. So let's get into it. Um, so, yeah, the first of the, you know, three main ways that we're going to talk about is increasing your, your salary. Um, and this is pretty much, I mean, done how you'd expect, right? It's just trading your time for money in the form of a pay raise or working overtime, right? So we're going to touch on that in a little bit. The next way we're going to touch on is by working a performance-based job. Performance-based job is any job that pays you based upon your own merit and efforts, right? So like a real estate agent, a salesperson, any commission workers, a mortgage broker, anyone that's getting paid based off of their performance. That, that is a performance-based job. If I go to work and I get a paycheck for, you know, this no matter what I do and I get the same amount of my paycheck, that is not performance-based. <laughs> you are you are being paid based off of what they think you are worth. Not necessarily, you're not controlling your own worth in that sense. You're not controlling your own destiny in terms of how much you're going to earn. 
So we're gonna touch into we're gonna touch on that too this episode, and then the final thing that we're gonna uh, well we're not even gonna I, I'm gonna mention it, but we're not gonna talk too much about it. It's starting a side business or like uh, you know a side hustle, however you want to call it. This is a you know it looks different for, for it looks different for everyone, but however that looks for you is um, one of the things that we're gonna touch on. But we're gonna touch more on that next episode just because I think we can get a lot deeper into that in terms of like you know how you can. Uh, structure that to really, really, you know, maximize uh, the situation that you're in now. So, like I said, we'll talk about that next episode. But I did want to mention it here just so that I mean, people know. Oh, well, so because I know somebody might think, well, what, what about starting a side hustle or a side business? So I just want to mention it and make the point that we're going to talk about it. So, but one thing I do want to say <clears throat> is that this episode. Um, is mainly for the person that's working a job that they absolutely despise uh, and they want to earn a significantly higher amount of money, right? It's not necessarily for the person that loves their W-2 job, loves what they do, um, and is just, you know, super uh, happy to do their job. It's not necessarily for that person because I'm never going to tell you to, you know, stop doing what you like to do so that you can earn more money because at the end of the day it's not all about money um it's definitely a big factor obviously that we think that but it's not all about that so, so um you definitely want to be doing what you enjoy doing over you know something that's just you know that you're not going to enjoy but it's paying you well so to an extent <laughs> but, and uh, i agree with all that we're going to we're going to get a lot into it uh, throughout this episode but i do want to start off by giving a perspective of the american dream so uh, j- j- like just to preface it american dream is tip is like how, the standard of how americans think they should live like from the be- from the beginning of when they're first born all the way up and through their working career all the way to retirement is basically saying that Starting off early, like early, when you first start off, like the first 18 years of your life, you go to school for about 14 of those years from age four to whether you go to high school at age 18 or if you just continue out through college. Uh, all throughout that time, you're just you're in a school system that's pretty much shaping you to become what's considered a W-2 employee. And that's um for for a long time, that's just been the status quo. That's been the, the way to go about doing things. And it still is a little bit to this day. And um, they like they almost try to stagnate you or try to limit you on your imagination on what you uh, can do in, in this world. It's like what was acceptable in society. Steve Harvey always uh, tells a story of when he was in like I think he was in fifth grade. He um, had an assignment that was in in, cla- in a classroom where the teacher said everybody needs to write down what they want to be when they grow up on a piece of paper. And t- at the end of the assignment, they turned up, turned into the teacher and she was going to read them all aloud. So uh, he, Steve wrote on his paper what he wanted to be. He, uh, they all turned in the papers to her. She started reading them off. So they were just hearing things like doctor, lawyer, engineer, um, beautician, all, all sorts of stuff like that. She didn't read Steve's until the very last one. She And she actually didn't read it at all. She told him to come up to the front of the class and uh, read his aloud. So he's like, oh, yeah, I'm special. I'm going to give me like a gold star or something. So uh, he gets up to the front and uh, she says, Steve, tell everybody what you said you wanted to be. And he said, I want to be on TV. Oh, sm- proud and happy as can be. I want to be on TV. And she said, now, why did you write that? He said, he's like, um, that's what the assignment was, wasn't it? And he said, she said, do you know anybody who, uh, who said, who, who, do you know anybody who's on TV? She's like, he's like, no. He said, do you, do you know anybody in your family that's on TV? He's like, no. So what makes you think you can be on TV? And that's pretty much how society is, is, uh, shaping people to think a certain way. They try, they try to, uh, basically say that you're dreaming too big. You need to be more realistic. And so that's and that's just how the system is. Like it, it doesn't. You never see in school them teaching you how to be the boss or how to run your own company or just to be an entrepreneur. And the problem with that is that it causes like a generational cycle. So from generation to generation, you have people who are just uh, predestined to graduate, uh, get a W two job. Then all of a sudden, now around this time they start looking for a spouse. They then they start buying a house. Like they they bought their first big expense. Now they got to start. T- on student loan debt now they got to start uh they all of a sudden they want a new car they start adding kids into the mix now you have all these expenses now you have liabilities you have things you have to pay for and now all of a sudden you're living paycheck to paycheck and so now 
you can barely make ends meet and you're un- unwilling to even take risks to like invest or anything like that. So now you're in a trap, which is uh, what uh, Robert Kiyosaki refers to as the rat race, because now you are uh, basically conform- conformed into the system where now you have to continuously fear not being able to make your next uh, mortgage payment, car payment, student loan payment, because you need to worry about getting more money. And so now you have two new emotions that are introduced into, into your life called fear and greed. Fear is not being able to make enough money, and greed is always trying to uh, find a way to, to get more money. But all, all in all, in the end, the American dream is not allowing you to have time freedom because now you're going to work for the next 40 years of your, of your life trying just to go in this constant cycle of I need to pay this next bill, I need to uh, take care of this, I need to take care of that. And you're never able to get ahead financially in life because you're always trying to make ends meet somewhere. And so, so now you can't take vacations. You, and if you do, you're only taking a five to seven day vacation. Uh, Steve takes a month vacation, and that's what I aspire to do when I get older. Not taking these five to seven day vacations. And the saddest <laughs> thing is, when you um, are going through this, your working career, and especially if you have a spouse, you're always telling, talking with them like, hey, when we finally get to the end, when, we're, when we finally are in our retirement, we're going to do this, we're going to travel, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Just keep on pushing through. And, and by the time we retire, we'll be able to do all these things. The saddest thing is, usually you're, by the time you retire, you're either too old or somebody has died off by that time. So you're telling me that you work from the age 20 to 65, and now you have pretty much nobody to share your free time with. And that's that's a very sad reality, but it happens all the time. I've seen it happen in my in my personal life to my loved ones. So that's one thing that I would hate to have happen for myself. And I'm trying to do everything in my power to make sure that, that, that that's not my reality as well. But in order to acquire it, in order to have this um, change in reality, you also have a, you need to have a change of mindset. So that's so all that being said, the American dream for me is not the ideal way for me to go. But it start this all starts with this podcast t- topic with the amount of income that you make and how to and, and understand how to scale it. It's <laughs> 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 <This is> beautiful. <laughs> that I've said so much, I'm done. I need some water. <laughs> No, but that was a great, great, great story. I'm glad you told that. Um, that's a, a great perspective too on it. Um, and it really, it really, really does start here because at the end of the day, the one limiting factor in everybody's life, or the one you know thing that usually is the limiting factor in everyone, the amount of money they make. Everyone says, "Oh, I don't earn enough," or "Oh, uh, you know, I wish I was making more money." And all these things tied to like, "I need more money. I need more money. I need more money." And yeah, I mean, yeah, it definitely is helpful to <laughs> learn how you can earn more money and make more money. But remember, I mean, keeping more money and, you know, uh, saving more money and investing money is very key. But today we will focus on that aspect of scaling your income. So, but yeah, great story, bro. <laughs> so, yeah, um, <laughs> let's get into the actual ways that I mentioned um, before. So the first way that I mentioned um, about or the first, you know, the first way to scale your income and earn more is through getting a raise at work or working overtime, right? So the problem with this necessarily though is, and I th- think <laughs> this is more of an attack on that aspect than it actually is a a, a s- support of it. But anyways, the problem with this is the fact that you know, no matter how well you do perform, you're going to be paid the same amount. And yes, you will earn more and you will, you know, get a pay raise and you can work overtime if your job has overtime. I apparently not everyone gets overtime. That is a murder. But <laughs> <laughs> um the part that's the that's the li- biggest limiting factor with having a normal, you know, nine to five W two job. It doesn't matter how much you, how well you perform, you're not necessarily you're not necessarily being paid more on that, right? The typical fact for like a young professional person, like I mean, just for myself, for example, right? So right now I'm a project engineer from uh, school in at, in 2017 December, and I immediately started working in January as a project engineer, right? And now I'm about to hit like that two year mark as a project engineer, um, and I'm about to be promoted now to a, a, a APM, and I'm gonna do that now for uh, APM is assistant project manager. I'm gonna do that for one or two years. Oh. <laughs> 
this is the I'm gonna just say the typical career track. This is not my career track because I'm not gonna be doing this. <laughs> but I'm about to say I just, to, I just had to preface this. But typical career track will be project engineer for two years, right? Uh, assistant project manager for two years, project manager for two more years or three years or whatever, senior project manager for four years. Then you become an associate now for five years. Then you become a vice president for another five years. And then if you're lucky and the owner of the company ain't still the president, CEO, then maybe you have a chance to become the CEO for five years. So, but what is this? What, what, what look at that whole, you know, <laughs> situation. What was that? What was the biggest thing in that, Marlon? The time that it took to get there. Exactly. <laughs> 20 years to become a CEO. I ain't got 20 years to earn, <laughs> you know, no crazy amount of money like that. I ain't got 20 years. I got five. So <laughs> that, you know, and the crazy thing is 20 years is a, actually a very rapid career growth path for most from most professions. Most professions, you ain't graduating from school and becoming a CEO in 20 years for most corporations, especially if you're talking, you know, Fortune 500 or even Fortune 1000 companies, you're not going to be a CEO of these companies that fast, especially if, you know, the actual founder or the owner is still within the company. So, yeah, that's not necessarily really practical if you do want to earn more money now, which is, you know, exactly what this is about. So, Man, I'm, basically what you just described is the corporate ladder, and that's and the corporate ladder. Those pr r r those rungs in between each step is like five, well, it's two to five years apart each one of them. So that's it's a very slow growth, and that's honestly why this option is probably not the most efficient for scaling, because um, and like you said, all all jobs or all W two jobs are not don't offer overtime. I know mine did not back where I worked last year. Murder. And <laughs> so you could, you could come in working 40 hours a week or you can come in working 120 hours a week. You can get the same pay regardless. And that's the one thing that I did really didn't like because it really kills your productivity. Well, it, it kills your incentive to um, have a high work ethic. Like, um, I'm, I'm somebody that's used to giving like 150% with everything that I do. But if I'm going to, if I can give the same 100% and be compensated the same way, regardless of how much effort I put in, it's going to almost dilute your work ethic a little bit. And um, that's one thing that I really don't like about uh, salary based jobs because I can go into, I can go into my job and um, work eight hours a day and um, only have four hours worth of production. And some, and the, the people that at, at work would almost see that as acceptable. Versus if I come in for four hours, so I work from eight to 12, but I put in eight hours worth of work in and left at 12 noon, they'll be like, oh, no, if you just if you're that productive, just stay for eight hours and put in 16 hours worth of work. <laughs> so like it's just I don't know. They don't reward you for uh, the pro your productivity. They reward you more so for the time that you've put in. And yep. that's so that's it's, that's why it's really hard to scale with. Of salary based jobs because all they're looking for is to take your time more so than your productivity. Yep. And that's, <laughs> boy, it's an indentured servant. That's crazy <laughs> though. But if you, the, what, I mean, to me, the crazy thing about that whole thing and that whole like, you know, stigma of a nine to five job and a W 2 job is like, think about if you, if you, let's say you work for a company, right, and you save them a million dollars through something that you initiated or one of your like uh, plans or something you did to initiate them to save that a million dollars your boss is gonna laugh at you if you ask for 10 percent of those savings You're like what you want a hundred thousand for what you know what you signed up for you signed up to be this this uh worker bee and we we get to make that money and then we're mm -hmm. gonna take those profits that you saved us and split it amongst the top tier uh, uh executives of the company you can get your little, little you know two thousand dollar bonus or whatever but you're not going to touch none of this, uh, you, the big money. You're making the higher ups <laughs> rich, but you just keep on working for exactly. them. Exactly. And that's my whole, that, bro, when I be at work, sometimes I'd be like, ah, yeah, I'm just sitting here making this. Like, you're so <laughs> rich right now, bro. Be, be getting to me sometimes, man. I'd be like, ah, this five years ain't taking too long. But, you know, that's, that's in essence, the, <laughs> the, that's the whole dynamic of a, W two job. It's really, really hard to scale. I mean, you can do it, and you know, obviously, this is just a very, very general case. There's different scenarios, and like I said, this also, like I said, doesn't really apply to you if you love your job. If you love what you do, then the money might not even be that big a deal to you, or you're happy with the amount that you make, and that's fine. Happiness is the most important thing here. So yeah, let's get into the next, you know, possible way to uh, scale your income. So the, like I mentioned before, the second way is to work a performance job. 
So performance-based jobs pay you as well as you perform. So this, in a sense, allows you to scale your income significantly faster just by working harder. You are in complete control. You have full autonomy over how much you earn. That is both a bad thing and a good thing, though. Because <laughs> if you don't, if you don't necessarily have that work ethic, you're not gonna learn. You're gonna, you're not, you're gonna earn as little as you put in. But if you have exponential work ethic and you're putting in 150 percent, then you have a a lot higher potential to earn significant amount of money in any, you know. At any time period. I mean, if you're a real estate agent and you closing uh, one one uh, property a, a month, I mean, you're gonna get paid for that. But if you close in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten a month, you getting paid for that too. So you can you can be a five hundred thousand uh, dollar real estate agent if you wanted to. And you can also be a thirty thousand dollar real estate agent. So it works both ways. But that is, in a sense, what performance based job means. I can't I got to reemphasize that because that's the key thing to think about when you're trying to get into a performance based job. You have to be self driven. You have to have a why that's strong enough to push you through all the tough times, because in the beginning, I promise you, that's going to be the like that's just grunt work. Honestly, it's going to be a lot of hard work in the beginning and not a lot of uh to show forward in the beginning because now you're trying to right now you're really trying to build credibility more than anything else as like it's like alex said with a real estate agent if you if you fresh out the gate all people people not even gonna know you so they really not gonna trust you to do much you have to like really work on building yourself building your brand and that's gonna be the, the thing that's gonna take the most time so and that's gonna take a lot out of you most likely more likely than not so if you're not sit well self-driven it's probably it's probably safer for you to stay with your salary based job and just go slower as far as the scalability but the, i will say the best thing about um what's it called a performance-based job is the the exponential scalability because that leads you to more money over time which you can uh, which you can use toward investments like later on and would that will ultimately bring you that time freedom and that financial freedom that you're so seeking mm -hmm. that's a good point and then the last way that i mentioned earlier that too much into is just by you know starting a business alongside your full-time job um, this can just be considered like a side hustle or a freelance job or whatever you want to call it. But in a sense, what you're going to be doing and uh, like I said, we're going to talk more about this next week, but you're just leveraging your nine to five to earn more income um, using your 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 professional skill set to earn more money and increase your earning potential. So but like I said, we'll get into that a lot more in detail next week. Um, but let's let's I want to take a second or a minute to look at which of these is the most practical approach. Um, and like I said, it's not. It's not a, a set way to do this. It's different for everyone. But just if you look at it from a holistic approach, just looking at the whole entire you know situation, the one independent variable in each of these is your time, right? Time is the only thing that is uh, constant in each of these. So what I want to do is first, I want to let's look at the average daily time distribution for a salary employee and how a salary employee spends most of their day. Um, so for most, sleeping seven to eight hours and you're working, doing work related activities in for eight to nine hours, you're, you might do your leisure for two to three hours, household activities for an hour, eating and drinking for an hour. Everyone's different. So that's but that's in general how most um, salary employees days are distributed. So based on this whole thing, what is the what, what is the thing that's holding this person back from earning more money? It's his time. Most of his time is being spent doing salaried work and commuting to and from work. So most of your time is being spent and dedicated to your nine to five job. And yeah, you can cut back your leisure and your activities, but there's a lot more value if you work, uh, if your work day was spent trying to scale your income. So in a sense, the, the most practical way to earn more money, just looking at those first two, is to be using your waking hours to scale your income. Not necessarily to, you know, spending your waking hours at a nine to five job if you want to scale your income and if you are not happy with your job. And this doesn't even mean that you have to quit your day job and work a performance based job. Yeah, it, just, it definitely doesn't mean you have to quit your job by any means. Like, I think we're, we're perfect examples of how you can leverage your sa your salary based income in order to uh, build your personal like a business on a side, because um just like last year, that's exactly what we were doing um, in order to get to like be able to invest in real estate. That's what we were doing. We were saving the bulk of our income and basically living a frugal lifestyle. That way we were able to put the money that we saved towards investments that were, would generate more income for us over time. Yeah. 
definitely. And like I said, we're gonna get more a lot more into detail on that next week. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's worth mentioning now, just for the sake of this conversation. Um, but yeah, the perf- uh, if you look at the same time distribution for a performance based worker, they're able to spend their waking hours, let's say, just in general, to cover uh, you know a majority of that distribution between five a.m. and twelve a.m. They're able to spend those hours um, if they wanted to do that. So in a sense, this gives them a lot more control over the amount they earn as opposed to saying, OK, you only got from nine to five. To... And it really doesn't matter <laughs> just because it's a W-2 job. It, if your W-2 job was from nine to five or it was, you know, if it was a four hour day, you're still earning the same amount of money. So it really didn't matter. But you just it's the fact that a large portion of your time is just dedicated to a set amount of time. You're not really you don't have or sorry, a set amount of earning potential. So you never really have a. A chance to earn more money a performance-based worker has more control over the amount they can earn they have they have the potential to earn as much they are dedicated to earn in, in a sense it's unlimited earning potential if you really wanted to look at it theoretically it's unlimited earning potential so um but like i said i only i have to keep saying i only recommend this if you don't like your job it's not worth your happiness if you truly enjoy what you do you should Continue to do that because honestly, it can take years to develop the expertise and network of resources that are necessary to, you know, outscale someone that has a salaried income. Um, because performance-based jobs, you do sacrifice a few things um, whenever you do take a performance-based job. For example, you take or you might take a pay cut in the beginning just because, you know, you don't necessarily just start working a performance-based job because a lot of these jobs don't necessarily have like a you don't really necessarily need formal education, formal training for them. So you can't necessarily just hop into it and just set, earn like, you know, the amount of salary worker might be earning. But if you do have the work ethic, then you can do that. But I mean, from majority of cases, you're going to take a pay cut just so you can develop that expertise. Like I said, in that network of resources, while you're doing that, you're not going to be paid as, you know, how a salary worker might be. And also, I mean, there might, you might not get any benefits like a salary job, but I mean, that shouldn't really be, you know, a thing to stop you, I think, at least a benefits thing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the benefits. I think a lot of people actually use that like as a big excuse to not to want to go into a performance base actually because they are they are worried about getting uh, risking not having things such as healthcare or like their four hundred one k. But honestly, you can just seek those out elsewhere as far as getting those benefits. Uh, you can just like you can buy insurance for yourself or like like you you don't even invest in your own four hundred one k because you're gonna use that that money to invest elsewhere in something that can get you, get you a better return on your money. So I mean th- those options are out there. It's just that people are scared to to basically take action in the first place. But where yeah. I think the real big challenges lie is like I said before, having that consistency and that motivation to get through that that first initial barrier, because now you're taking a pay cut plus you're putting in more work in a, initially in order to uh, for exponential gain later on. So now you have to have that delayed gratification factor. Mm-hmm. And honestly, you got to stay consistent because if your if your work stops in a production based job, your money probably will stop as well in a lot of cases. So it's like say a contractor is actually a good example of a product performance based job that if you stop working like if you stop doing contracting work good luck seeing some more income coming in because if you're not if nobody's hiring you you're not getting no money whatsoever but i think that's also a good reason why you should have some reserves in place before you take on a performance based job yeah definitely and just to comment on the benefits thing real quick i mean yeah it is because i know some people will think this and it is yeah it is significantly more expensive to get your own you know independent Mm -hmm. health health insurance and uh you know, those sort of benefits. But like I said, it shouldn't necessarily be a limiting factor, especially in the beginning, um, because there's ways you can, you know, uh, support yourself before if you especially if you have, you know, reserves and those things to where you can cover emergency expenses or anything. You shouldn't. No means I'm saying tomorrow or, week or even <laughs> this year, you just go quit your job. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not not what we're saying. Um, if and, Unless you had the means to support yourself in, you know, the beginning of that, that performance based job, uh, you know, cycle. Cause it's like I said, it's not, you're not going to get paid as much. So, um, yeah, but now what we kind of want to do is just touch on, you know, some of the changes that you can make to actually earn more income or some things that you could actually do, like regardless if you work a W2 job or a performance based job that you can actually that you add things you can actually do to earn more income, right? So the first thing, and I think this is really the most important thing, 
is developing high in demand skills. Well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the most important, but it is very, it is a good option, I think. Um, and that's developing high in demand skills, right? It's 2019. It is very, very easy to learn new skills. It's just a matter of going, you know, and out the knowledge there is tons of resources out there in 2019 man there's no excuse not to learn anything you don't want to know. it's not freaking 1999 or even 1989 or anything it's 2019 the resources are out there for you um there's so many skill sets that can you know you that actually allow you to earn you know more than fifty thousand dollars a year without a college degree um you could be a software developer you could be a contractor you could be you know a real estate agent a mortgage broker um a lot of these sk- are things are just skills and education you can seek out on your own um especially when we're talking about technical degrees like i said i can't i always this is the you know the inf- the information age uh robert smith says this is the fourth industrial revolution in a sense because mm-hmm. you know tech is literally changing the way our lives uh, are in the day-to-day you know dynamic so there's so many opportunities to gain technical skills that are going to be so valuable to so many people um and a lot of these you know professions don't require degrees only merit right um you don't necessarily need to go get a college degree to become a software developer or learn how to code you can literally do that stuff and learn how to do it on your own and then you know <laughs> go find a job or you know some sort of uh you know profession that allows you to earn a significantly higher amount of money than you may be earning now um and to on top of that you don't even have to quit your job necessarily to do some of these things right you don't have to quit your job to do software development on the side you don't have to quit your job to be a real estate agent on the side it'll be hard really trying to work in a sense you're working two full-time jobs if you are putting the you know same effort into both but it's you don't have to necessarily quit because the fact that they're side jobs is like it allows their there's things that you can do like um, just at in the after hours or, you know, on lunch breaks and things like that that, are, that won't be like as pressing because nobody's paying you to do it in that moment. So um, another thing that you could do also uh, in order to earn more income is and I think this is important, too, when it comes to, you know, especially or um, business in general is find out how you can add value to someone else's business. This is very key. We talked about this a lot, adding value to someone, right? What skills do you have um, or develop that will be beneficial to someone else's business or their operation? If you can do that, I guarantee you, you will be a commodity to a lot of people because a lot of people aren't able to necessarily do that, right? We talked about it when we talked about, you know, finding a team in your real estate, when you're trying to go, you know, find a mentor, you have to, you had, you, whenever you're looking for a mentor, they are, you're trying to find out what they want or you are, in a sense, trying to add value to their business, their real estate business. So how are you doing that? And it's the same thing in every other aspect. How are you adding value to other people's uh, operations and business? And I can't necessarily tell you how that how to do that. You just have to look at their operation and their business and see, OK, I can help them with that or I can help them with this. And I'm going to tell them I can do this. So that's another thing. And then uh, the final thing that we kind of want to touch on that you can do to you know, increase your income is find some synergy between your nine to five job and your business. Um, If you do this, and when I say synergy, I'm just saying in a sense, you know, taking on, you know, multiple things and how, how, how do things correlate, putting efforts toward one thing that ultimately allow, you know, the other thing off on top of that and not necessarily just by intentionally putting effort into that. Right. If you can do that, you're going to have a large shot at success. You're going to have a large shot at success um, if you choose to go down a path that synergizes with your current life circumstances. So, But like I said, this is more so tied to next week's episode, so we will be talking about that a lot more in detail next week. Very well put. I think the good takeaway from all that was just to be an asset to somebody somewhere. So like like Alex said before, if you can find a way to add value to somebody else's business, that'll be a great way to like basically uh, allow yourself to create create more income for yourself overall because now somebody's willing to pay you to do something that they don't want to do because you have expertise in it and they just say I I'd rather they rather spend their time elsewhere than trying to learn what you are already skilled in doing. So that's yeah. a very good way and and then like Alex said with the information age being as prevalent as it is right now, if you can be a YouTube or Google Google King or slash queen, 
Like you can literally learn just about anything that you want to in this world using Google or YouTube, because I mean, everything is readily available at your fingertips. Honestly, you just don't choose to do nothing though. That's, I think that's the big takeaway. Take something <laughs> from this episode and apply it to your life. Don't just be like, oh, that was a good episode. I'm all right. I'm gonna keep on living my current lifestyle because I promise you in 10 years, you're gonna look up and be like, oh, they, they got all that success now. Oh, they, they was lucky. Nah, listen. Luck is not it's not the thing that uh, that we are of anything at all. It, we, <laughs> we might be a lot of things, but it's not lucky because I promise you, the grind is serious right now. And luck is like by definition, I, I love this definition. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So we are do, doing all the preparing that we can right now. So if you want to call us luck, just say that yeah, we prepare very well. And the opportunity presented itself to us. Yes, we that that is something that we that we were if anything at all. So get prepared now so that when opportunity presents itself to you, you're also ready as well. Facts, facts. Luck, L U C K, laboring under correct. <laughs> yes. So. Exactly. But anyways, that's it for this episode of the Money Monopolizers podcast. New episodes will be released every Thursday and will be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Just search Money Monopolizers wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you learned something of value today. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you rated us and left us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find out more info about us on Twitter at the Monopolizers or on IG at Money Monopolizers. We post informative content on there that'll keep you engaged. So check that out and share those posts. But until then, we're out of here. Damn, bro, you getting dark. I know. <laughs> I've been saying, I've been thinking that like, boy, please finish this. <laughs> You've been listening to the Money Monopolizers podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. To learn more about how you can be in control of your money, visit moneymonopolizers.com. We'll catch you next time when Alex and Marlon share more personal finance and wealth creation tips with you. Now it's time to take action.